Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening Dhamma session. So last night we talked about mindfulness. I thought it would be good to follow that up with the other half of the equation, which is vipassana. Why it's the other half of the equation is we we describe this technique, the tradition that I follow as satipatthana vipassana. Mahasi Sayadaw was maybe one of the first to use that phrase, or he, he, he used it and he has books called satipatthana vipassana. Whenever you take a, when, when people come to take a course with my teacher in Thailand, he'll have you actually memorize a phrase. Vipassana naineo satipatthansi. Vipassana in line with the four, four satipatthana, four foundations of mindfulness. One body, two feelings, three mind, four dhamma. Have you repeat that just so you get it, get it through your head? What are we practicing here? We pass in as an interesting word, um, or it's interesting what is said about it. I, I, I often remember uh, being told that vipassana, you can't find vipassana in the Tipitaka. A monk once told me that. Now, if we're just looking for the word vipassana, you, you can, of course, find that word in the Tipitaka. It's, the Buddha. it's in the Buddha's words. Um, that you don't have the various um, explanations and, and the, the, the frameworks that have been made up to, to describe and to teach vipassana. You don't have that uh, really in the, in the Buddha's words or what we have of the Buddha's words. But vipassana is as a concept or as a, as a thing, is very much a part of the Buddha's teaching. And I think it's fairly easy, if, you have, if you're familiar with the texts, to see why the later, these later traditions have, have stressed this word. Right? They've used this word as sort of a, a catchphrase to describe what we're practicing. So now, nowadays we hear about vipassana meditation or insight meditation. And as I've said, it's not really that accurate. You don't practice vipassana. And you practice uh, satipatthana, you practice mindfulness. But we call it vipassana meditation, or if we call it vipassana meditation, it's because this is what happens when you practice mindfulness. You come, you cultivate vipassana, you come to see clearly. So anyone who says that this isn't, this is a later invention or it's not something the Buddha came up with doesn't really have a familiarity with the texts or hasn't really thought deeply about what the texts are actually saying. The word vipassana comes up quite often, but more than that, you find again and again these phrases whenever the Buddha is talking about or, or often when he's talking about cultivating wisdom or, or, or uh, seeing things as they are. He'll say things like, Aditananva kameyana patikam keyana gatam Pachupanancha yodamang tatha tatha vipassati Don't go back to the past, don't worry about the future. What's in the past is gone, what's in the future hasn't come. Whatever arises in the present moment in front of you, see that clearly, vipassati. Or andabuto ayang loko tanuketa vipassati. Again, this word vipassati, vipassati is the verb. It means he or she 
sees clearly or, or however you want to translate vipassana. Blind is this world, andabuto yang loko. This world is blind. Very few see clearly. Tanuketa. Very few here. Few here see clearly. And so that's what mindfulness is supposed to do. Again and again you have the Buddha talking about seeing clearly or seeing with wisdom. So when we talk about what is vipassana, we often simplify it by saying vipassana means to see three things. Right? Because the Buddha said, sabe sankara anicca ti yada panyaya pasati. Whoever sees with wisdom, when one sees with wisdom, that all formations are impermanent. Sabe sankara anicca. Sabe sankara dukkha. All formations are dukkha, which means suffering or unsatisfying, and so on. Sabe dhamma anatta. All dhammas, all realities formed or unformed, are not self. Yadapanyaya pasati, when one sees with wisdom. And I think it's worth mentioning to sort of understand that pasana means seeing. So it's actually a figure of speech. And it, it makes sense that this wouldn't be something the Buddha used chiefly. Chiefly the Buddha used the word or, the, or phrases, or the construct, panya or pajanati. So panyaya pasati means to see with wisdom. Panya. Panya means to know fully or know truly, to truly know something. Translated as wisdom, but it means to patnya. Nya means to know. Pat means fully. So more often the Buddha uses the word know, like vipassana means. Yeah. Or pasana is a word they use when you see something, when you look at something and you see it. But what's useful about it, uh, of course, even in some ways more than, than, than wisdom, is that it reminds us that this isn't intellectual. You have to see with wisdom, but you have to see for yourself. Another verb the Buddha uses is sachi karoti. Sachi karoti means to see for oneself, to to know independently of, of belief or rationalization, or logic, to really know for oneself, to experience, really. But so what do we mean when we talk about vipassana, what, what, what it refers to? And so in brief, it refers to seeing the three characteristics, impermanent, suffering, non-self. This is what vipassana meditation should show you. And I mean, it's, it's the way it's phrased, often without much explanation, um, can make this, this teaching a little confusing. It's not like you're going to look and you're going to say, oh, look, impermanence jumps out at you. What it means is that our attachment to people, places, things, to, to pleasant experiences, our aversion to unpleasant experience, it comes from misunderstanding about reality. We take certain things as stable, constant, uh, lasting. As we take them as satisfying or fixable. We see, we, we, believe, we have the idea that by clinging, by fretting, by obsessing over things, we can find happiness. That if we work with our experiences, and if we fix them just right, we can find happiness. And we believe that there is, uh, there is substance and there is control and there is a self and a soul and, and possessor 
and all these things having to do with self, which is really a complex set of views. But it relates to the idea that there is some essence to things, like uh, people actually existing, or uh, like uh, bodies being under our control. I can move my arms and so on. think we're in control because, you know, look at me, I'm moving my arms, right? And so all of these turn out to be um, based on, on poor, a poor grasp of reality. And when you focus on reality moment to moment, you start to see it's not quite the way we think it is, that both the body and the mind are very much impermanent and the world around us very much impermanent. We went through this today in our study group. I think we, I think that was a really good section that we went through because it details. What do you mean by impermanence? It means this comes and it's it's gone. When the next thing comes, that doesn't come. The last thing doesn't come over. It's gone. Every moment. When what did it say? When when you're hungry, uh, you experience the physical reality with. Very harsh and unpleasant and ugly. Everything is, is, is. Um, you know, the physical form is unpleasant. When you're satiated, everything is wonderful, and, and the physical form is, is comfortable, it's pleasing. And so it says, uh, when you when you're aware of this, you can see how. Um, how reality changes from moment to moment, and how we experience it one moment is very different from how we experience it the next. Impermanence. Start to see that thereby we can't find satisfaction or real happiness by clinging to things or by trying to fix things because they're impermanent, but also because, third, they're not self. They're not under our control, and so you think you're, it's you moving your arms whenever you want. Well, try doing, try watching a simple movement, and we watch the stomach rising and falling. In the beginning, we think I'm the one making it rise and fall, but as you watch and watch, and when you walk and you think I am walking, I'm making myself walk, but when you really watch and see what's going on, you see, oh, I see. There's actually just this interplay between body and mind, moments of mind's, mind and body state. There's no self involved. And you come to, to see how, how uh, constructed and artificial it all is. This is the sort of thing that you, know, you start to let go. When you see clearly in this way, you start to see how... how the word sankara, what it actually means, it means that this, our reality is constructed. It's like an artificial. It's like a robot. We are we are like robots, constructs, and you become uh, disenchanted. Atanibindati duke. So the second thing that vipassana means is not just the three characteristics. It also refers to this process of realization that comes as you start to see the three characteristics. So you, I mean, it's a real shift because you know, much of what I'm saying might sound foreign to many of you. I mean, this is the kind of thing that should sound wrong. I mean, the, the idea that the body isn't under our control, the idea that things aren't stable, that the idea that you can't find satisfaction or happiness in the world, this should sound quite wrong to us. I mean, it's normal for that to be the case because our ordinary understanding of reality is very different. We think, you know, samsara is, is wonderful. There's so much, so much to be found, so much to be sought out and gained. But as you, st you make this process and when you first step through the door and you start to see things clearly, vipassana, by using mindfulness, by being objective, you know you're not you're not indoctrinating yourself or taking up a, 
a perverse practice or a cultish practice. You're just trying to see things objectively. When you when you are perfectly and strictly objective uh, and honest with yourself, boy, does it change. And so you go through a series of knowledges which, um, you know, they're they're very much the same. They go in the same line for everyone, and that's why you can document them. You can talk about the stages of insight. Some people are, I think, rather skeptical. I think I was quite skeptical until I saw how it works. You know, everyone is different and they won't all manifest the same, but it's quite interesting how the mind goes through a progression, but it's basically the progression of moving from seeing things as stable, satisfying, and controllable to see them as un impermanent, unsatisfying, uncontrollable. And so it starts by seeing this discreteness of experience as they arise and cease. This one doesn't continue on to the next one. Um, and then you start to you start to investigate that, and the mind starts to appreciate appreciate this discreteness, especially the cessation aspect. And the mind starts to realize that um, given that, that this discreteness, it means nothing lasts, it means nothing stays, there's nothing that is a stable refuge and it starts to kind of obsess or, or really observe the cessation and begins to, to see how unstable reality is, it can be quite frightening at times. But the mind starts to wake up, and you see the meditator begins to uh, alert, become alert to the danger, like standing on thin, walking on thin ice. He thought this was a solid platform, this body, this reality. As you start to see everything cease, you start to wonder, what can I hold on to? And the mind is grasping for something to cling to. And you begin to see that nothing's worth clinging to. You see how, how the clinging is causing you stress and suffering causing you stress and suffering because nothing, nothing that you're clinging to is stable, satisfying, or controllable. And that's when Nibida comes, as you start to uh, become disenchanted. And as you become disenchanted, you start to feel trapped. You really feel this, this constructed nature, this artificial nature. Everything feels like a trap. Your body is a trap. The mind is a trap. And you feel like you're caught in a cage. When you start to incline away like a snake, they use this simile of the snake shedding off its skin. The skin starts to feel kind of dead, uh, fake, you know. And then one strives, one hits the higher stages of knowledge and then one is on the path. And there's no, no question if they continue where they're going to go, because at that point they've got this unshakable uh, conviction based on strong observation until eventually they become completely equanimous in the final stage of insight where we, where we get to the peak of vipassana is when you really see clearly and you see that everything not, that nothing is worth clinging, you, clinging to you see everything simply as experiences that arise and cease And that's the last of the vipassana stages where you have perfect equanimity. Doesn't mean you enter into a state where you're perfectly calm. It means everything you experience, you experience, you see clearly as arising and ceasing, not as good or bad or me or mine. But you become more and more refined in your observation. There's no more reacting, no very little liking or disliking. Until eventually it, it's like this um, feedback loop where it gets stronger and stronger and just because it's more and more refined, the repeated mindfulness builds up such strength that uh, it's like a sonic boom kind of, you know, the sound waves building up, building up, building up because you're seeing clear and clear and clear to the point where the, there's the epiphany moment where one sees the Four Noble Truths, one sees everything 
everything in samsara. Nothing in samsara is worth clinging to. And one thus turns away from it, when the mind withdraws, it's like it drops away, completely relinquishes its hold on samsara and enters into nibbana, cessation. Which is, of course, the ultimate goal of vipassana. Vipassana is not for vipassana. So our goal is not, our actual goal isn't to see clearly. Seeing clearly is only the stepping stone for becoming free. Because nibbana is this freedom from suffering that uh, it's very hard to describe or understand. It's the kind of thing you really have to experience for yourself, even for just a moment. And it changes you. It changes you something drastic. Such peace and relief, and you find that you're, all the things that you cling to, not all of them, but many of them, you've, you've relinquished your hold. You relinquished your ambition for getting, for obtaining, for being, for fixing, for controlling, for samsara. You've given up your attachment to it, or you've reduced it. So, that's vipassana. Vipassana is this practice. Vipassana is really, why we focus on it is because it's this progression that comes from the practice of mindfulness. Mindfulness we put first, it's what we practice. But what happens when you're mindful, it's not just, oh, now I'm mindful, now I'm going to live my life in a better way. No, you're going to change quite a bit. And the change, the process of change is vipassana. When you, as you come to see clearly, many things about you and your life will change for the better and none for the worse it's not a it's not like you have to doubt about it in fact it's not something that it's not the kind of change that you have to decide on it doesn't take a decision because it's all clear it's all unequivocally um, inarguably right you know the, the change is from your view through seeing clearly without a doubt the proper course of action. So after you've seen clearly for someone to say, are you sure? That doubt doesn't arise in the mind. You know, you're absolutely sure because you've seen far better than any argument or any text or any teaching could do. You've seen clearly the right and the wrong way. You've seen that which leads to happiness and that which leads to suffering. That's what it means to see clearly. That's what Vipassana is. And that's the Dhamma for tonight. So thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best.